son as a sacrifice to wait, take away our sins. You know, God hasn't responded to our love. We've responded to God's love. If you've got a relationship, if you're in faith with Jesus, it's because you've responded to God's love. Maybe this morning you don't know of God's love. Maybe God is going to touch you by his Holy Spirit. He's going to visit you and tell you, I love you. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. And verse 19 tells us this. We love each other because he loved us first. If we want to love and we want to be a loving church, and we want to reach out to our community in love, and we just want to love each other and love our kids as we should do, love our parents, love our friends as we should do. You know, the secret is this, or the mystery is this, which God has revealed to us, that we need to discover the love of God. And if you are loved by God, you find it so much easier and natural to love others. And so, Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you that you show us the way, that we're not trying to, to work it out and figure it out, that you show us the way. And we choose today to love you. We choose to worship you this morning. And Lord, as your word just says there, we choose to love each other as well. We choose to love the unlovable in our community. And so, Lord, we just lift you up and we just pray as we worship you, we respond with our hearts and our emotions our souls and our spirits to you and we say we love you and Lord our worship this morning we pray that it will be acceptable to you Holy Spirit we thank you that you enable us to worship thank you Holy Spirit that you show us and reveal the love of God in our hearts this is how we know that it's a, a guarantee from you that your Holy Spirit is within us and we pray Holy Spirit that you will enable us to worship in spirit and in truth this morning in the name of Jesus we pray Amen. Let's stand and worship this morning and show all the for God. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning to you. Um, I just want to share a little bit about this song we're going to sing. And it's titled, It Is Well. Um, my wife Susie and I, uh, like many of you, uh, have been or in, and in, in a battle this week uh, from a couple of fronts. And I know there's other people in this church in the same. And I were encouraged this week. Uh, on, on Wednesday, I listened to Kirsty and her testimony. Who were there uh, to you that on, on Wednesday? Uh, that totally and utterly inspired me. And then I listened to other people as well who I've been talking to who are having battles and there's stuff going on in the world. And I thought about our situation with uh, what's going on with me and Susie and with uh, other things. And I was sent uh, a song. And I'll send this song, It Is Well by Sheila. The good thing, the important thing about being in fellowship in a church to be around is when things hit the fan, people start sending you text messages and encouraging you. And that's what it is as part of being in a fellowship that you're not on your own. And I shared this morning about Moses, who was struggling. Uh, he was arms raised and his, the, uh, the battle, the armies were winning. And then his arms started to fall because he was tired and he was getting on a bit so his hands started to fall and when that happened they started, they started losing the battle so what happened people came on side of him they sat him on a rock and they, they, they grabbed hold of his arm and they lifted it up and the other side his arm got lifted up and, 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 the, and guess what the battle started to be won again and that was because of the people, the persons that are the side of him. And that is fellowship. That is being involved in a church. No matter how deep or shall your faith might be, or are you not sure of the questions you're asking, you're in a place this morning around people who will lift your arms up for you when you are struggling. So that said, I was thinking about this song, and I've heard it hundreds of times. And I've always sung it, and now that I'm preaching, ah, it is well, it is well. Thank you, Lord, it is well. And then I got to send this in the midst of what we're going on. And do you know what? I, th I thought about it and prayed about it. And I started seeing for a different reason. I thought to myself, that's a statement of defiance. That is a statement of defiance against the enemy and against the decisions you, the decisions you might be in. And I want you to think about that this morning when you sing it. And I, even when I was praying about it, I imagined all you guys in front of me, the ones particularly in battles or in fighting this morning, 
we protest banners in the hands against the enemy. And the enemy's there and he's talking and he's playing and you're stuck there with his banner in front of you and he says, it is well. It is well. And it's become a battle cry now because inside, when things are going on, inside, you've, sometimes you've got to really dig deep but God's there. And inside, he will tell you, if you listen, if you listen above all the noise of your situations, he'll listen and he'll tell you, and it might be a whisper, and it might be, it's well, it is well, it is well. So I pray in the Jesus name, Lord Father God, would you today, in the holy name of Jesus, let the people in this room and watching and the families of the people as well know, let them know that no matter what is going on this morning, it is well. And I ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen.
is for all been about declaration. Declaring who God is, who Jesus is. I speak the name of Jesus, that he is the life, and he is my healing, and he is my life. Pray, pray for our, and declare it for our families. And You know, if you just sat down, you stand up again. Let's just continue in worship. We're going to pray this morning. And we're going to keep declaring. Let's stand as a church. Stand before the Lord. We keep declaring that we are people who are forgiven. That we're saved by the grace of Jesus. We pray for our families and we declare life in dead situations. In hopeless situations we speak your life. We speak your way and we pray for your way. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with provision, paying bills, buying food. Lord, I just pray that Lord, you will resort us, Lord. Give us wisdom as we live our lives, Lord, as we manage our finances. But Lord, we pray that you will deliver us, Lord. Pray for those this morning who were bound by addictions. Lord, we don't, we choose not to give in. We keep pressing through. We keep on going. We keep on seeking you. We keep on knocking. We keep on looking to you, Lord. And we declare life in those situations. Pray for those who grieve this morning. Pray for oil of gladness yes. instead of mourning and despair. Yeah. Lord, we commit those who are loved to you, Lord. Lord, we move on, Lord, and we choose continually to worship you. Lord. Pray that we can worship through the grief and grief bereavement, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you will come and minister to us. Lord, pray for those who are sick this morning. We've declared as we worship that you are our healer. And although sometimes in our bodies we sick, Lord, you are our healer and we refuse to give up. And we keep praying because you are the healer. And Lord, whatever is blocking our healing, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come against it. And we take authority this morning in the name of Jesus over sins, over strongholds in people's minds. Lord, we just look to you. Lord, when we look around, not many others can help us, Lord, in this time of need. But Lord, you can. You can do a miracle in our life. You change our situations around. And Lord, we just pray. Speak your life. Speak forgiveness. Speak God's grace and God's mercy over our lives. Lord, we pray, Lord, forgive us for what we've gone our own way. Lord, we pray that you'll empower us. Thank you for your word, that it is truth in our life, brings direction. And Lord, we pray for your word to be outworked in our lives. Praise you. Thank you for worship this morning. What a, 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 a joy and the privilege it is to worship you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for instruments, people who can sing, people who've got an art for worship. Lord, we thank you.
corner is open. The way is open to you is not closed. Your way is cold. Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. And though we draw near to you, one way. And we just pray, Lord, that you will meet our needs. Lord, we just pray that as we continue to worship and hear your word and just be together, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will continue to speak to us, lead us, and guide us. Let you place things in our hearts, keys to get us through life, to get us through our situations this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Feel free to take a seat. I can't do anything. Just click it. You're in the, in the life of brave church. We want to be a brave church. And you know, if you've read the Gospels and the life of Jesus, that there was a time when Jesus went into the temple and they were exchanging all sorts of things. And Jesus turned over the tables and said, My, my house will be a house of prayer to the nations. We want to be a, a church that one of our values is this, that we're a praying church, that we start with prayer. And that's what we want to do, we want to keep on praying. And we start with prayer, we pray in the middle, we pray in the end. We pray as though everything depends on God. And do everything as though everything depends on us. And we want to keep praying. And you know that over January we have had a month of prayer where we've been praying, we've been fasting, we've been praying in the mornings and in the evenings, we've had prayer events. At the first phase. And, you know, we've got another fantastic opportunity as a church that on, on Wednesday, it's not just Valentine's Day, on Wednesday, it's the beginning of Lent. What is Lent? You know, Tuesday is all about pancakes. Anybody like pancakes? Yeah, yeah. Feel free to come down on Tuesday for a pancake in our coffee shop. But you know, it's all about, it's all about preparation. And it's about 40 days before of Jesus before he went into the wilderness to be to, to, to fast and to pray to connect with God and to be, be tempted and to, and to break through spiritually. Lent is all about preparation and we've just got a video, I just thought it'd be helpful, you know. Sometimes we, we say what's well, Lent and it's Palm Sunday and it's this and it's that. Sometimes it's good just to know a little bit of the background, what is Lent and, and why do we do what we're going to be doing this month. <coughs> Russian spies and fish fries. This coming week, Christians all over the world will observe Ash Wednesday, kicking off a season that we call Lent. No, Lent. If you've spent any time around church in your life, you may have heard of this season. Yeah, isn't that the time before Easter where we give something up? Well, kind of, but Lent is actually much deeper than that. Lent is a season on the church calendar that stretches 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. Traditionally, Lent is treated as a time to reflect, repent, and prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter and Christ's resurrection from the dead. But where is Lent in the Bible? Well, the season and observation of Lent does not actually appear in Scripture. Oh, well, that's it. I'm done. However, just because the season of Lent does not appear in Scripture doesn't mean that it's not founded on biblical principles. For example, in Greek, the season of Lent was originally referred to as tesserakosti, which means the 40. And this period of 40 days is not just some arbitrary number, but 40 is a number of deep significance in the Bible. This is the same duration of time that Moses spent on Mount Sinai and Jesus spent in the wilderness. And in both of these circumstances, both Moses and Jesus were fasting during these periods. And because of this, fasting and prayer are two of the main focuses for many believers during Lent. This is why you often see churches doing prayer journals or challenges during Lent. This is also where the idea of giving something up for Lent comes from. Because fasting doesn't always have to just do with food. You can fast from a certain type of food. You can fast from television or social media. In this season of Lent, I'm fasting from watching the NBA. 
It's a difficult sacrifice. But have you ever asked the question, why do we fast? Why do we give something up during Lent? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's not because God wants us to be sad and grumpy all the time. And it's not so that we can brag about how we crushed Lent this year. I don't even know who would be impressed by that. But the idea of fasting or giving something up for Lent is so that we have more room to pursue God in our lives. In essence, the fasting portion of Lent means removing something to make room for the one thing. It means removing a distraction or creating more room in our lives so that we can truly pursue God and his goodness. And just like Moses' Tesserakoski, or 40 days, prepared him to lead God's people across the desert, and just like Jesus' Tesserakoski prepared him for his public ministry, our season of Lent is meant to prepare us to experience the full joy and celebration of Easter. So you see, Lent is not just about saying no to something. It's actually about saying no to something for a while to prepare ourselves to experience the full measure of God's yes. And so with the season of Lent starting in a few days, I want to challenge you to enter into this season resolving to pursue God with greater intensity. Maybe you'll do it through fasting, either fasting from food or something else in your life. Maybe you'll do it through consistent daily prayer, study, or reflection. Maybe you'll go above and beyond in your giving and generosity. Whatever it is for you, I want to challenge each and every one of us over the next 40 days to pursue God like never before so that we can celebrate Him like never before. Fabulous. It does it far better than I do, doesn't it? You know, we just want to uh, we want to enter into Lent just as if it's as, as, as easy explained prayerfully and precisely, definitely. I forgot the words. It's good and cold. Intentionally. Intentionally. And we want to intentionally pray. We want to intentionally fast. And we want to intentionally become closer to Jesus. You know, over, over this next um, 40 days, starting from Wednesday, you know, if you are on church week, we've got your email, we're going to send you an email, which gives you a Bible reading plan and a prayer plan, so that as a church together, we can be praying together. So it's not going to be every single day, like we did during January, so one of prayer plans, so if you download that, you print it, or, or look at it on your computer, on your email, that each day, for 46 days, that we're going to be praying and fasting together, so that we're praying into the same things and you know history soon soon gonna be in fantastic I love it's to do it's a great time of year. So that's what we're gonna be doing from Wednesday up to Easter. You know we've got some other things going on during the church calendar and we've got connections groups. I'm just gonna ask um, Lynn and Gary just for one moment but just just thought it's just good opportunity that this is part of our reaching. You know we've got four Four banners that we're going to reach out and worship, we're going to reach in in our discipleship, we're going to reach out as we reach our communities, and we're going to reach beyond by building a church which is relevant for our coming generations and for future. And part of that reach in is about connecting week by week. You know, if I just relied on a Sunday morning in my relationship with God, I'd be nowhere, I'd be drifting. So I need to spend time with Jesus on my own every single day. And then during the week, sometimes it's good to, to have a lift, to pray together and be together and encourage each other. And that's what connections groups are. And we've got, how many have we got? Nine. So we've got new to faith. So if you were new to faith and you've got some questions that, you know, Steve and Gail are going to be here on Wednesday nights over these next three weeks. Um, where they can answer your questions, where you can just go a little bit deeper. And it's just open for questions and just to, just to get to know about Jesus and, and, and your faith in him. We've got other prayer groups going on in the coffee shop. We've got a prayer group. If you just want to come and pray for an hour, you can come down on Wednesdays at 7. So you can see Wednesday nights is quite busy down here at the church. Tuesdays, we've got a women's connection group with Maggie and Sue. And they come down 10 o'clock in the morning until 12. And they get into God's Word. And they, they talk about how, how relevant is God's Word to us in, in 2024. And then we've got youth as well. Youth connections meet on Sundays, 7 to like 30. And then we've got um, um, young adults, Billy Malcolm, Wednesday night over in Accrington. If you're a, a young adult, 
video are free to access that. There's more information on the uh, reception desk as you go through at the end of the service. And then we've got pizza and uh, Margaret and Peter Capstick over in um, what no, no area of Andrew, is it North? North. West Accrington, there you go. And Hyde is part of that group, leading that group as well. So if you were part of West Accrington, then you're free to go to that. And then we've got Tony and Stephen Vanders for one, who were over in the Burnley area. And then we've got a new group because our groups are expanding. And we've got a group down in the, the town of Church where Andy and Amanda and Natalia and Peter have got a new group there. So if you are not in a group and you're part of Maybe that community in church, lower end of our whistle, that that will be a fantastic group to go to. And also, during the year, we want to be putting courses on, looking at parenting courses, marriage courses, um, teenage courses, so, so that we can grow and develop, so that we can become, make, make better choices. And you know, we're going to be starting on a week on Wednesday with Peace to Freedom, Freedom in Christ course, which Lynn and Gary are going to be running down here each Wednesday for 10 weeks. So I'm just going to pass them over to, over to you. Gonna... Yeah, we run a, a group, we've run a group, but we've, uh, this one, we're transitioning to what's called a Freedom in Christ course. So it's a discipleship program and uh, it runs for 10 weeks. It's got 10 weeks of uh, videos, really solid biblical teaching, with activations as well. And it's about growing, it's, it's about growing, releasing us into our freedom, the, the freedom that Christ bought for us. So, for example, our identities, the systems of the world, we've got voices saying, you know, you're useless, you're worthless. And that's not the truth that we have in God. So, it's about being brought into our identity in God, who God says we are, that we're loved by Him, that we're accepted by Him, that we belong to Him. So that's kind of a little bit of flavour. We'll run through some uh, freedom uh, issues in terms of confessing sin and uh, breaking strongholds and getting into right ways and patterns of thinking. Yes, and this is the outline of what the course is going to be. Um, so it's living out your new identity in Christ, Breaking through to spiritual maturity, understand God's purpose for your life, uncover strongholds and deception, resolve issues from the past, become an even more fruitful disciple. I mean, when we did it last year, it's just a powerful uh, uh, time, and we've been uh, journeying with God for, for some time, but there's always stuff that God needs to do in our lives to break us free from who we thought we, we are to who we need to be in Him. Because we all have blind spots, we all have things that we've carried on that we're now taking on as our identity. But God wants to break through in that and have to reveal our true, our true essence of who we are, our true identity. So this is what this course is gonna be like. So we have limited numbers uh, because we're in a smaller room. So if you feel free, if you feel like this is for you. Fabulous, yeah. So there's 12 spaces. So if you were interested in that, you see the guys on reception this morning, and they will let you know in regards to being a part of that group. You know, on the 25th of February, we've got our compassion service. And we have one every year, and Phil Briggs comes along, and that's, that's fantastic. And it'd be great when Phil comes along. He's now in Uganda, I think, at the moment. He's travelling back before the, the service on the 25th of February. But he's going to be coming along on that morning, 10.30. And we're going to be hearing about some of the work that's happening in Rwanda and some of the children that you guys are supporting. Then we've got about 86 children who are being supported monthly in regards to the day-to-day -day needs and the, the spiritual needs. And Phil's going to be coming, but he's also going to be coming along with Ronnie. I'll slide with Ronnie on. Ronnie is a guy who lives in London, he's a teacher. And he's coming up specifically that morning from London to come and speak to us and to share his testimony because Ronnie was brought up as a compassion child. So he knows more than many people, in fact, knows more than all of us in regards to the benefits of being sponsored and, and growing up knowing about Jesus and about God's plan for his life. So Sunday morning, I know that you're making it a priority and a curriculum anyway, but Sunday morning on the 25th of February is going to be fantastic. Invite your friends, it's going to be inspiring about how God can 
can work in other sides of the world, people in dear poverty, that God can turn them around. But you know what, the evening of that, of that day, we've got something also very special, and it is home worship. Thank you. House worship. And you know, the, these guys are from the Midlands, and they're going to be coming, they're part of Compassion, and they support Compassion projects, but they're a worship team and a ministry team in themselves. And they're coming on the Sunday morning, they're going to be leading this in, in worship, along with Ronnie giving his testimony, and Phil bringing the word. And you know, they're going to be here Sunday morning, but also Sunday evening, they said, can we come and minister? And can we come and minister through worship and song and testimony? So we said, go for it, you're up here, you're from the Midlands, we'll give you some lunch and we'll hang around and we can have a fantastic time of worship in the evening. So at 6 o'clock till 8 o'clock, we're going to have a fantastic time of worship. And again, just encouraging you to make it a priority. Don't pick anything else. Let's meet together and encourage these guys and encourage each other and see what God's got to say. Sometimes God uses people who come in and they've got something else on their heart. They speak something specific into the life of the church. So we want to be really intentional on Sunday the 25th to, to be here on the Sunday morning but also here on the Sunday night where it'd be great if you know of any other believers, anybody who doesn't meet on a Sunday evening, bring them along. It's just going to be a great time when we worship together. Fabulous. Right, children. Sign the lions around somewhere and I think we've got time where children are going to be going out now and Theo is going to be going to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for um, this time that we have together. Thank you for this series we're in. And Lord, I pray you would speak to us today. Would you reveal something new to us? And um, would you show us what it is that you've got for us? Um, but yeah, we give you the glory. Thank you for what you're already doing in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Great. I wonder how many choices you made this morning. I've just chosen to move this to the side a little bit. But I wonder how many choices you've made this morning. I wonder if you chose to have orange juice with your breakfast or coffee. I wonder what you chose to wear. I wonder if you chose to walk to church or drive to church. I wonder what you chose to do after church or um, for the rest of this day. But we're in this series at the minute of choices, crossroads. And so as we go throughout this series, we're looking at different choices that we can make. There's a passage in Deuteronomy that presents before us um, different options we have. And the Lord says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. And his command is now choose life. And so on the surface, it seems like a really simple decision. If you're following Jesus, you want to choose life. But how do we do that practically? How do we do that in each decision we make? So we've heard over the past few weeks how to choose life. We've heard how to choose to fear God. We've heard how to choose to pray, to choose to go to God in every situation. And we heard last week about um, forgiveness and how to choose to live forgiven that Jesus has forgiven us, but we have to choose to then live in that forgiveness. And we've looked, if you see these um, banners that we've got, these um, signs with crossroads on, it says, there is a way. Um, and that verse in Ephesians 4, it says, throw off the old and put on the new. And throughout this series, we're discovering that there's a transformation that takes place as we choose the things of God. That as we throw off the old and put on the new, a transformation takes place within us that leads us to the place where God wants us to go. And so we're going to continue with that series this morning. And there's a verse that's going to come up on the screen. It's from Proverbs chapter 8. And it talks about wisdom and what wisdom does. Um, and it says this. It says Proverbs 8 from verse 2. 
At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading to the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud. And so here we have wisdom standing at a point where two paths meet, at a crossroads, um, an intersection of two paths. And there's a choice that we all have with two different paths going in different ways. And as I was praying about this morning, about um, you know, what to share um, about this series, I, I was asking God, what is it you want me to speak about? And he said to talk about two paths. And I'm re- I was reminded of two paths that Jesus talks about. In the New Testament, Jesus is giving a sermon and he talks about two paths. And he says, he says in Matthew 7, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few find it. And so the choice I want to present us with today is will you choose the narrow path? Will you choose the narrow path? I love it if we could just get the back lights on, if that's all right, Alex, just so I can see everyone. That was a great choice. Thank you. Awesome. In um, summer of last year, I was privileged enough to go on a trip with my dad down to London, and we went down to watch the World Athletics. It was a World Athletics tour, and so as huge athletes come in, stars, national, international competition. And so we go down and there's thousands of people going to this athletics event. We got a train down early in the morning and from the station to get to the um, Olympic Park where the event is held, there's um, all the streets are marked off and sectioned off and there's thousands of people walking down to this event. And it was an amazing event, great atmosphere, great weather. And it's brilliant, we go, we go through the security, we go um, to our seats, we watch the event, and then we're coming back out, and I'm kind of, I'm aware of the time, I'm aware that we've got a long train back, you know, we're in London, um, and so I'm aware we don't want to miss the last train, and so I'm thinking, right, we need, to, we need to leg it when we get out, and so we get out, and as we come out of the doors, we kind of, I realise that everyone else is thinking the exact same thing. And so there's thousands of people all trying to get out at the same time, trying to head back to the same station. And so as we're going through these streets, I'm trying to look for a different way. I'm on Google Maps. I'm thinking, is there another way around this that's quicker or we can, we can run around? Um, we can't find a way. And so me and my dad, being the athletic men that we think we are, we decide we're going to weave through everyone. And so there's families going with prams or there's um, parents and, and their kids. And we're trying to weave in between. We're trying to sneak through. Um, and we, we make our way as far as we can, and eventually we reach a point where the crowd's just too strong. We can't get through any further. We're on this path, and we're struggling. We can't make any progress. I'm thinking, ah, we can't miss the train. We can't miss it. We're going to be stranded in London with all these people forever. Um, but fortunately, as we go along, in a flash of inspiration, I look over to one side as I'm looking around, and I see these restaurants, and there's some tables outside. And obviously, to get to these restaurants, people have to be able to get there. And so there's, there's a nice little walkway next to these tables. And I see them, oh, that's a, that's a good way to go. And so I go and I find the fence um, where all the people are. And then on the other side, I manage to sneak through. And we go on this little, it's only a small path, but there's no one else there. And so I'm like, Dad, you need to go this way. So we get on this path and we, we leg it down to the end of the street. We turn around the corner and we rejoin the group. And we manage to weave our way and we get to the train on time. We made it back. All was good. But in that moment... We, um, we found a narrow path that no one else was walking on, and it led us to life. And so often in our walk with Jesus, we need to choose between following the crowd and the broad path and following the way of Jesus that sometimes takes us at a different pace, and it takes us in a different direction, but it leads to life and prosperity. Do we want to follow the crowd? Do we want to follow what everyone else thinks? Do we justify our decisions based on how everyone else would have responded to that situation? Do we treat other people the way that everyone else treats them? Or are we following the narrow path where Jesus calls us to go? And when Jesus calls us on the narrow path, sometimes we have to maybe lay things down. When Jesus first called people, he called his disciples. And um, in Matthew 4, there's an account of this. It'll be on the screen, just one verse, because Jesus is going along and he, he sees Simon and his brother Andrew, and they're fishermen, so they're in their boat, they're fishing. And Jesus sees them and he, he calls them and he says, come and follow me. And what they do is they, they drop their nets. It says in verse 20, at once they left their nets and followed him. And then Jesus goes along a bit further and he sees James and John. They're with their father Zebedee in the boat, they're fishing. And he says the same thing, come and follow me. And they, they leave everything. They leave their father and their nets and their fishing business and they go and follow Jesus. And I was thinking about this, like, why did they, follow their, why did they, they drop their nets in order to follow Jesus? And in one sense, it's kind of obvious 
Because could you imagine if they'd have followed Jesus but not dropped their nets? So they'd be going from town to town, healing people, praying for people, preaching, whilst carrying these massive fishing nets with them. It would look a bit ridiculous, wouldn't it? But for some of us, we have nets in our lives. And for these guys, the nets represented a way of life that they were living. Um, for James and John with their, their father in the business, it could have been a family tradition. And so their nets could have represented their, their plans for the future, their dreams and ambitions that they'd set out, the traditions that they'd been living. Maybe it's a way of thinking or an old way of doing things. Or maybe it's the way that everyone around them was operating. If they were in a community of fishermen and they were all fished together, maybe they would have to leave that behind. And so what is it for you that you're carrying? Is there a net that you're carrying that represents maybe an old way of doing things, an old way of thinking, or an old way of living? Because God says in Isaiah, in Isaiah, um, he says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. And now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And so often, in order for us to perceive the new thing that God is doing, we have to be prepared to let go of the old thing, the old way of doing things. I know for me, in my life, as I've kind of grown up, I've had lots of different plans of what I've wanted to do in my life. I remember um, growing up early on in my life, I wanted to be a footballer, and then I wanted to be an athlete, and lots of different things. Didn't work out, as you can tell, I'm stood here not playing football. Um, but throughout my life, there's been different things. And as I've grown up, I've felt the call of God on my life, um, and I've, I've followed that. And one of the things that I've really wanted to do is I wanted to go abroad. That was my goal. I was like, I just want to, to move to a different country. I would hear about missionaries who would work in Africa, or I'd hear about people who went to like Australia or America and worked with churches, and huge things would happen. They would follow God and see miracles, and it sounded amazing. And so that was my plan. And so at the age of 18, I left home, and I joined Youth for Christ. I was part of a band that toured around the UK. And I was like, it's not quite abroad, but it, it's, it's the step in the right direction. And my plan was simple. After this, this first year, I told people my plan was to do this year, and then I was going to go abroad, and I was going to find a church maybe and work with, or do some, some mission work in, in a faraway country. And it wasn't that my life in Oswald Twistle was boring, or that I didn't love my family or my church or what was going on here, but I was familiar with it, and I'd grown up here, and I wanted something new, something exciting. And so during my year out, when God called me to come back here, I kind of had this situation where I was holding one thing of my dreams of going abroad and all of a sudden God's call on my life and I had to choose. I was stood at a crossroads with two paths, a broad path, which looked really fun, or a narrow path of coming back to Oswald Twistle. I bet you're glad you're in Oswald Twistle this morning, aren't you? <laughs> but I had to choose and so in order for me to perceive what God was doing and to follow him down the narrow path, I had to let go of my plans. I had to let go of my dreams and that's not to say that God can't still do amazing things through my dreams, or it's not to say that if God's given you a dream, you um, can't follow that. But following God, sometimes you have to lay down what you thought you wanted, or what you thought you were going to do. And I've got a clip um, I'm just going to show. It's going to be on the screen. And this is a clip um, that kind of, in my eyes, sums up what it's like going through the narrow path a little bit. And for those of you who've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, I'll just give a bit of context for those who haven't. There's a clip at the start of one of, this, one of the films, and at this point in the film, they, um, they've decided to rob a bank. And so Captain Jack Sparrow and his crew are robbing the bank, but they're not just robbing the bank of the money, they're taking the whole bank with them. And so this is the clip, um, so we'll watch it for a minute. Great. So Jesus says to enter through the narrow gate. And as these guys were going with, their, um, with the bank that they were robbing, they um, realized that they couldn't take it with them. If we could just have the lights back on, Alex, that'd be great. Thanks. And so there are things as we enter through the narrow gate that we can't carry with us. Jesus says to enter through the narrow gate. Um, but what does a narrow gate look like if it looks like something that we can't carry everything with us through? See, a broad gate, a wide gate, you could, if you're carrying a big load, if you're carrying a bank, then you can fit through. But if it comes to a narrow gate, 
we're going to have to put stuff down. There's things that you can't enter into God's kingdom with through the narrow gate. There are things you have to lay down in order to get into his kingdom. And as you stand at a crossroads with two gates in front of you, two paths, you need to choose which one you're going to go in. And you can't take all these things with you into the narrow path. Because a narrow path has a narrow gate. And I don't know if you have ever seen um, a TV show that I used to watch years ago on telly. It was called Hole in the Wall. Anyone ever watch Hole in the Wall? A few, a few. The basic gist of the, the program was that they'd get these contestants, usually celebrities, and they would stand on a platform with some water behind them. And the clue is kind of in, in the title. A wall would approach them, and there would be a hole in the wall. But this hole wouldn't be any ordinary hole. It would be a certain shape. It would be maybe they'd have to lie down, or they'd have to, to get themselves into a particular shape. And they would hope that if they were in the right shape, when the, the wall approached, they would fit through the hole and they wouldn't get knocked into the water. And for us, as we go through life, if we're trying to fit through a narrow gate, could you imagine if these guys had been having maybe a bag on their back or if they're carrying a wide load or if they're carrying something that's not going to help them and it's not going to fit through the hole, they would have been pushed back. And as we enter through the narrow gate into the kingdom of God, there's certain things that won't fit through. There's certain things that we won't be able to carry. And so I wonder what it is that you're carrying that won't enter through the narrow gate. Maybe you've had setbacks. You've been going with Jesus and you're walking. You're trying to go through this narrow path. But every time you take a step forward, it's as if something pushes you back. Is that because you're carrying something that won't enter through the narrow gate with you? You're going to have to choose to lay it down or to get knocked back. I wonder what it is that you're carrying. Maybe for you it's an opinion. Maybe you've got opinions or um, beliefs that aren't in line with what God says, what scripture says. Maybe for you it's pride or envy or guilt. Maybe there's shame that you're carrying over things from the past that God has set you free from but you're still holding on to. Maybe it's fear, fear of failure, fear of things in the future. Maybe it's bitterness or unforgiveness, maybe towards someone else or even towards yourself. Maybe it's addiction or sin. You know, we've heard the statistics around pornography and how common that is. And I know for me, there was a time in my life when I struggled with that. And on the front, you could never tell. On the surface, it seemed all fine. But it was hidden. There was this hidden sin that it was like I was trying to sneak with me through the narrow gate. And every time I would get to the narrow gate, this secret sin almost would hold me back and pull me back. And there came a point where I realized I can't carry this anymore. And so it had to be brought into the light and had to be dealt with. There's a verse in Proverbs. Proverbs 28 says, Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And so what I would say to you is if you're struggling with a sin that's in the dark, that's where it has its power. When a sin is in the dark, it has power. But as soon as it's brought into the light, we know that the light overcomes the darkness. And so if you're struggling with something that's hidden, I would encourage you to confess it, to bring it into the light, to tell somebody because once it's in the light, it loses its power. Right. And we're going to have to lay these things down if we want to journey through the narrow gate on the narrow path to where God is calling us to be. As I think about a narrow gate, I've often heard the illustration of kind of going through airport security. And I was, um, last year, able to go through airport security by myself for the very first time. I was going on a flight to, to Belfast um, just for a few days, but it was by myself. And so I was preparing, I was Googling like, how to go through airport security and what you need, what you don't need. And it was a really short trip. In fact, it was so short that I only took the bag on my back. And so in this bag I had, um, I managed to get a wash bag that was see-through so you could put all your liquids in, um, all my different soaps in small bottles. And I did take a change of clothes, you'll be pleased to know, even though it was a short trip. And so I went through airport security at Manchester and I was, oh, it was a great experience. This is something new, something exciting. I went to Belfast and had a few days there. And then as I was coming back, I can remember being in Belfast airport and it wasn't too busy. There weren't many people. And I went through the security. I put my bag on the thing. I took my clothes off. I went through the, um, the big scanners and I went through to the other side and I went to get my bag. But my bag wasn't there. It was in another pile. I thought, oh, this is so exciting. They've taken my bag. What are they going to find? Even though I knew there was nothing bad in it, I was like, oh, what are they going to find? And so after a while, this woman, she kind of sees the bag and she, she's like, is this your bag? I'm like, yeah. She says, you're going to have to come around here. And so she gets the bag. She kind of starts looking through it. She starts pulling things out and she's asking me about different things. I'm thinking in my head, she's going to pull out the Bible and she's going to ask me about the Bible. She's going to say, are you a Christian? I'm going to preach. 
that opportunity didn't, didn't come, uh, not this time. But she keeps going, and eventually the problem is, is identified that because um, I had this new wash bag, it had broken. And on my way in, I kind of discovered this, that not everything was going to fit inside it. And so fortunately enough, they, they, provide with, they provide you with clear plastic bags in case people are underprepared. Like, why would people be underprepared? But anyway, I, um, I ended up putting some of my soaps and liquids in this other bag just so that, you know, they won't fall out and all of that kind of thing. And so I get through this security and she says to me, she says, you can't have two bags of liquids. It's too much. You're not allowed to take them on the airport um, into the flight. And so I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know you weren't allowed two bags. And so using her airport security skills, she's able to then put all the liquids into one bag and seal it and make me look really stupid by not being able to do that myself. But in that moment, I realized that there was something in my bag that I was carrying that I was unaware would prevent me from going further. And I wonder for us, do you have something in your life that you're carrying that maybe you don't know you're carrying? You aren't aware you've picked up, but it's going to prevent you from entering through the narrow gate. That if you want to journey further with God, if you want to go deeper, if you want to go down his narrow path, you need to make sure that you've not got something in your bag that's going to prevent you from getting through that gate. Because things can come in so easily. Sin, burdens, bitterness, unforgiveness, whatever it is, we can pick things up and if we're not careful, we're going to carry them with us and we're going to get stuck at the narrow gate. When I was with Youth for Christ on my year out, there was um, about 18 of us and we would meet regularly throughout the year for training, for different things. Um, and so we would get people from Youth for Christ or external speakers to come and speak to us. They would do teaching, they would do uh, training, maybe in theology or youth work. Um, and so we would do these things and we would get to know some of the people who would speak to us. And I was like, these guys are great, you know, just didn't think much of them. They were kind of, they were cool people, they were delivering teaching. Um, there was one particular guy who would deliver some training, he was really great, um, he was full of wisdom. Um, and I remember a few, I think it was a few months into my year, I think it was after worship practice one evening, me and another band member, we needed a lift back to where we were staying. And so this guy who did some of the, some of the teaching, some of the training, he gave um, him and his wife, they gave us a lift, gave us a lift back to where we were staying. And you know when you can just tell someone's in a tired mood? They kind of, they'd been tired all day and you could tell that I was like, I'm not going to start a conversation with this guy. He just looks shattered, like he doesn't want a discussion. And so I tried to avoid a conversation. However, a conversation ended up being brought up that had some, let's say, theological elements that we disagreed on. And so I had one opinion about something and he had a different opinion. Um, and I knew that he was a strong-willed kind of character. Um, but this conversation was brought up, not by me, I might add, but this conversation was brought up and we ended up having this discussion. And I say discussion, but it was more of him lecturing me on his opinion. And so he would tell me, he was telling me what he believed and how what I believed was wrong. And I would try and interject and defend myself, but unsuccessfully really. And so I, I got out of the car when I got there um, and I was kind of like, who is this guy? You know, he's just, just talking at me and he, who does he think he is? And does he not know how intelligent and clever I am? Like I know all my theology and all this. Um, but he's just basically shut me down and not given me a chance to defend myself or, or share what I believe. And I thought, wow. And then I kind of caught myself and I thought, I can't let that define my year or my time here. And so I'm going to leave it. I'm not going, to, I'm not going to think about it or dwell on it. And so I left it. I put it to one side. And I carried on throughout my year. And the only thing that was different was that when this guy was brought up in conversation, if people would speak positively or negatively about him, inside, I was on the negative side. And I was thinking, yeah, that guy, just, just, just leave it. Just leave it. Let's not go there. And so it, fast forward a few weeks. And as a, as a year out as a whole, we meet for training and we're getting this teaching from different people. And I can remember one particular morning, I remember it clearly. I was sat on the sofa and I looked up to see who was delivering the next session. And it was this guy. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to sit here for an hour and listen to this guy talk again. And I just, I just don't want to hear it. And it was in that moment, it was like the Holy Spirit just kind of brought my attention to what I was thinking. And I was like, I'm carrying something towards this guy. There's a, there's a bitterness and there's an unforgiveness towards this guy and I'm aware of it and it's, it's really bad. And I was like, where's this come from? How's this so deep? But I realized in that moment, I was gonna have to let that go if I wanted to go further through the narrow path. On this journey with Jesus, I had to let that go. And so I thought, how can I do this? Lord, how can I lay this down? How can I get rid of this bitterness and unforgiveness towards this guy? And I was reminded of something someone said about what Jesus said, actually. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Love those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. And so in that moment, I knew that this guy was almost like an enemy in my head, and I had to pray for him. I so, oh, 
I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to pray for this guy, great. Um, so I kind of, I think I prayed for him in my head, but I, was, I knew I had to pray for him out loud. I had to pray for him so he could hear me. And so at the start of the session, an opportunity was given. Does anyone want to pray for this guy before he speaks? You know, just pray for him that God would speak through him and all this. And I thought, right, this is my chance. So straight to, I said, I'll pray. And so everyone goes quiet. And I started to pray. And as soon as I prayed for him, there was this release. And all of the bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment towards him that had started so small but had built up over time, I just felt it release and it left. And I prayed for him and he delivered his teaching. And I got a lot out of it. And since then, I've heard him speak at different things and I've got a lot out of it and I've taken wisdom from it. And I've been able to journey through this narrow path further because I'm not carrying the bitterness and the unforgiveness that was holding me back. And just like going through the airport security, I didn't realize that something had got in my bag that wasn't allowed. I didn't realize I wasn't allowed to take two bags with me. And so I got pulled back. And as I'm going through the narrow gate, there was a point where I realized I'm not supposed to be carrying this unforgiveness. I didn't realize how it had got in but the Holy Spirit was able to show me and he was able to deal with it. And so as I laid it at Jesus' feet, I got rid of it, I put it down. I was able to follow him further. And there's a great prayer um, in the Psalms that I would encourage you to pray just as we go into a time of responding. It says this in Psalm 139. It says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And that's a, it's a bold prayer to pray, to ask God to see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. But I want to encourage you to, to pray that prayer. And as we go into this time of response, the band are going to lead us um, in a song. But the first thing I want us to do is, is to pray that prayer, to ask God to search our hearts, to see if there is anything in us that we're not, we're not supposed to carry. Maybe it's something you didn't realize you picked up. Maybe I've, as I've been speaking, you're aware of burdens in your life, things that you're carrying that you know you're not supposed to. And so the first thing I want us to do is to pray that prayer, to ask God to search our hearts. And the second thing I'd love us to do, um, we've got some, some rocks down here um, and we've got a cross. And we went into school recently and we were talking about the future and how God has plans for our future. But in order to get, grab hold of them plans, we have to lay down some things from our past. And so we did a real practical um, application for that. We got them to, to hold a rock and to think about something from their past maybe or something that was going to hold them back from going into the future, what God had for them. And they really simply just came and they took it and they put this rock at the foot of the cross and they laid it down and they said, Jesus, you can have this. I don't want to carry it anymore. And maybe for you, you want to do that this morning. It's really simple. There's some rocks down here and you just come, you pick up a small, small rock, think about something that um, you know, you're carrying that you shouldn't be, you can tell God what it is, and just simply put the rock at the foot of the cross. And in doing so, it's an act of, it's a symbolic act of just saying, God, I'm laying this down. I don't want to carry it anymore. It doesn't belong with me anymore. And so they're the two things I'd love us to do, just as we respond. I'm going to pray in a second, and then I'd encourage you to pray that prayer, to ask God to search your heart, see if there is any offensive way in you, and ask him to lead you in the way everlasting. And then the second thing is, if you want to lay down something practically, physically, you want to come to the front, you can grab a stone. There'll be a team there of people who can pray as well if you want prayer. But it's just to lay that down and just say, God, I'm laying this down. I don't want to carry it. If I want to go in this narrow road, through this narrow gate, I'm going to have to lay things down. Whether well, that's a net, like the fishermen. If it's something you need to lay down. And so I'm going to pray, uh, and then we can do that. So Father, I thank you that you know our hearts. Thank you that your desire is for us to enter your kingdom through the narrow gate. And Lord, I pray you would reveal to us things in our heart that we're holding that maybe are stopping us from going through the narrow gate. Would you search our hearts, God? Would you test us and know our anxious thoughts? Would you see if there are any offensive ways in us and lead us in the way everlasting? We thank you that you are speaking. Thank you that your desire is for us to go down the narrow path. In Jesus' name, amen.
is calling Oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open why forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling
I'm really relieved and thankful to God that we're not religious. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And what Theo's been talking about this morning is a relationship, not religion. Not where we just try and tick off the boxes and do what we think we have to do. But you know, a relationship with Jesus is, is where God just speaks into your heart. And sometimes we sit there and we think, I've got so much to deal with. It's just going to strip me naked. I can't do it. God in his grace and in his mercy he knows and he speaks the Bible talks about a still small voice and maybe there's things in your life and in your heart and in your mind and you think I just need to lay it, I need to get rid of it I need to lay it what a fantastic way to do it this morning what a fantastic word you know we're going to continue to worship in just a short while and you know maybe there's other people a lot have responded this morning. Maybe there's others and you're just thinking, I can't do it. I like to do this and I like to do that and I can't lay that net down. I can't give it up. You know, God never asks us to give up anything. But what he asks us is this, to replace it, to exchange it. Not to give it up, but to exchange it. You know, when we give things up, it leaves a big hole in our life and it becomes empty if we allow God to come into that all into that, that, that void what you're giving up it brings fullness of life I can't give up this anger I don't give it up exchange it for God's love I can't give up this unforgiveness I'll exchange it for God's forgiveness God's grace and his love Whatever it is in your life that God wants to replace it and he comes by his Holy Spirit and whatever you give up for God or exchange for God he always exchanges it for something better always exchanges it for something better and so Lord we just want to thank you for your word this morning thank you that we can worship you thank you we can lay things before you knowing that you will exchange it a divine exchange and we pray for that divine exchange in our lives Lord we give up our sin we exchange it for your righteousness Lord in our weakness we exchange it for your strength in us trying to get it right with our families to be good mums and dads Lord, we exchange it for you working in us and through us, Lord. We give our children to you. And Lord, in the life of this church, Lord, as Theo's mentioned, Lord, if we have any grievance against others, Lord, we just pray that right now we can put it right. Lord, we don't want to go through life heavy with an heavy load of unforgiveness and anger and bitterness and shame and resentment. But Lord, we choose joy and peace and patience kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Lord, we just want to be absorbed by you, by the fruits of your spirit. Lord, we thank you that you minister to us. Lord, we just want to give you our thanks. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, we're going to sing that song again and we're going to bring our service to a, a close, but you know, if you need to allow God to minister at some, some more Maybe that you've got something else that you want to lay before God. You feel free to that. If you need to go, you feel free to leave. But we're just going to worship and we're just going to give thanks to God and just allow God to seal what he's done in our hearts and our lives this morning. Let's just worship.
Father, we just want to thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can sing about your blood and, Lord, how you've forgiven us. And, Lord, we, we just pray that this Valentine's week, Lord, Lord, we remember your love for us more than anything. And, Lord, we pray that we can grasp how high and how deep and how wide is your love for us, Lord. Help us to understand and walk in that life of love. Help us, Lord, to have that love that you have for us, one for another, Lord. Help us to go that second mile with those, Lord, at work and in school. And, Lord, wherever we are, in our families, Lord, we, Lord, we just look to you and we just commit this week to you. Strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless this week.